to Jericho because what? Life's too short to have nothing. Let's see how it works. All right. I'm guessing that at some point in time, you as humans have been in a situation where someone hurt themselves, right? I, it would be very rare. It would be extremely rare for you to get to this point in your life and say, I've never seen anyone injured. I've never seen anyone cut themselves, crush their hand. It's, it's foreign to me. No, we all have, right? So you're at your workplace, wherever it happens to be, uh, a shop, a plant, or whatever, and you hear crash. And then, then you listen, you're like, oh, something. Then you wait for the yelling. And you run back into the, the back room, or, or you're in the house, and you hear crash, and you run into the next room, and you see somebody doing this. And there's blood. You see the blood squishing out through their fingers. Oh, I do something. So what does everybody do? Well, this used to be a big roll of paper towels. Now it's only that. But they run to the kitchen. This is the typical mom thing. They run to the kitchen and they grab a roll of paper towels. And then they run to the victim. Or they run, if it's a shop, I've talked to lots of guys who've worked in shops and plants. And what do they always have stacks of? Blue shop towels, right? They run and they grab a stack of blue shop towels. And then they run to the person. Or somebody will get like super frisky and they'll rip off a t-shirt or whatever. And let's say a guy's laying on the ground by a piece of machinery and there's psh, psh, psh. someone's like, oh, I, I know what to do. I was a Boy Scout, right? And they, they whip out a belt and then they run around looking for a tool. I need a screwdriver. I need a something or whatever. Is that okay? Everything I talked about doing, is that, is that all right? I mean, are you allowed to do that? You're allowed. Well, yeah, right? You're allowed. Is anyone that is, you know, after, in the aftermath when the ambulance shows up and, and they get there and the guy's got like five pounds of blue shop towels around his hand and, and a ripped up t-shirt and all that, is, is, are they going to pull everyone aside and, and uh, scourge them for putting blue towels and a ripped t-shirt on the guy? No. What just happened uh, in New York? Do you need the, uh, the note, Zach? What? Do you need the time note? No, I, I, I made it Yes, you do. Network, you network connections occurred. Okay, there's a time. Jared, let's do your thing. So, uh, in, was it, Jared, was it New York? I don't know, it was a big city. The officer? Uh, where, no, where the, co the cops, the woman was a victim of a domestic and was all stabbed up and. In the street? They, they took, yeah. Yeah. It was like probably I'm New pretty York. sure it was in New York. People get stabbed a lot in New York. But uh, cops roll up and victim of a domestic. She's bleeding all over, and they're like, this chick's going to die. we got to do something. And most of the bleeding was coming out of her leg. And so they tried. And finally, they, the guy was standing there like, what can I do? They're like, give us your belt. And they whoosh, pulled off the belt. And how many are people wearing belts right now? Go to anywhere where there are young hipster type people. I, I did a, a kind of a, a survey. Young hipster people don't wear belts. They don't. But what the cops did is they did they did the cinch thing, where they looped it around, and they didn't have a tool, so they just cinched it down as hard as they could and yanked on them, right? Now a stiff belt like this, if you're a gun guy, a gun guy or a gun girl, and you're actually wearing a stiff belt that will support your gun, those are those kind of belts are really hard to make turns out of because you can't really twist them over. Is this better, and, and the cops that did that, the cops that grabbed the belt from the bystander and pulled it on and held it in place until the EMTs got there, they were praised. Everyone said, good job, way to innovate, way to think on your feet. So my question to you is this, if it's okay in a medical emergency for you to run around and grab blue shop towels, it's okay for you to go grab a belt from a bystander to pull off your t-shirt, tear it, and tie it. If it's okay to do all that, why is it not okay to have this on you already? But people say, oh, you shouldn't carry medical gear. Or why are you carrying that? What do you think you're going to do? Are you looking for trouble? Are you I always, expecting? I always heard about being sued. Yeah, oh, you're going you're gonna to be sued. You're going to be sued. Uh, oh, and you hear, we get that all the time. Oh, 
it is, it is almost amazing that I am standing before you today. Because if I listen to the common thought, I wouldn't be here. Because the common thought is, you can't teach that to citizens. You can't teach that stuff to civilians. You don't understand the liability law. Hmm? That's the C word. Yeah. They don't say citizens. Yeah, the, the civilians. You, you can't teach that to civilians. But, but I can teach an 18-year-old, a 19-year-old E1 private little giant PFC, private snuffy, right? I can teach him to save his buddy's life, but I can't teach you because it's like super magic. Like, you know, bleeding to death in the parking lot of the, uh, the Sarasota Square Mall in Florida and bleeding to death on some crap dirt road in Fallujah, it's all dead. The, your blood doesn't care where you are on planet Earth. If there's a hole in you, it's like, oh well, it doesn't matter. And that is fortunately, very fortunately, it's only taken eight to nine to 10 years to finally bring people up to speed. Uh, I've been beating this drum for, for many years and when you get back to wherever it is you came from, I can almost guarantee you, if you're in a conversation with people at a school or a church or your work or whatever, and you bring this up, they'll be horrified. Are you sure you're allowed to do that? And you say, well, why would I not be allowed? And you could you could bring up the shop towel thing. So if someone is it okay to run over and squeeze shop towels on them, then why can't I just take medical gauze or, or something that was actually designed to do that and use it? Well, as you see, attorney, it makes that argument makes no sense. There's no basic in logic behind the, it's okay to take a belt and make a tourniquet, but it's not okay to use a ready-made tourniquet. That makes no sense. But yet we still encounter it. How many people here own firearms? I'll admit that in public. Okay, how many people believe that they should and are able to use a firearm to defend their own lives? Okay, lives of anyone else. The same people that'll tell you, oh, I took you know, tactical killer pistol 101, and two to the chest and one to the face, and you know, drill them to the ground, rah, 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 all this rah, yeehaw stuff, right? The same people that'll say, I got a camber with hydroshocks, and don't mess with me, and you say, well, if you take them, oh no, you can't take that, oh, you, you can't put a tourniquet on somebody, there's too much liability. You just told me that you went to a school where you trained to kill human beings, and you're cool with that. Yeah, oh yeah, woohoo, yeehaw. But you don't want to go to a school where you learn how to put bandages on human beings because there's way too much liability involved. Ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, here's the dealio. And I've got an attorney present. Now I'm going to pick on you because you're an attorney, but you're the good one. There is no greater liability in life on planet Earth than taking the life of another human being. Go all the way back to the beginning. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, all the way back to the beginning. There is no greater liability than killing another human. You were either justified or it was a criminal act. But there is no greater liability. It's like, well, you can kill people, but you better never, I better never catch you putting band-aids on them. Because then we're going to have a problem. It's nonsense. It's insanity. But you will run into people that will say that. They're like, oh. It's, it's too much liability. It's crazy to me. And we gotta stop it. And slowly but surely, slowly but surely, people are finally getting it. They're finally coming on board. We just did, did any of you guys read the article that I just wrote uh, about what, what was it called? I don't know. Oh, Tourniquet something or other. You wrote it. Um, no, but it basically the, the Department of Homeland Security finally got a clue. And they came up with a program called Stop the Bleed. Yay! Now, in typical government fashion, the, the information that they're using is like 10 plus 15 years old. Okay. They got, they got an old army manual somewhere. They're like, hey, it says right here. But at least they're forward thinking. Uh, the governor of Mississippi, Phil Bryant, came out in a public statement. Uh, one of the... Jackson SWAT officer was killed during a drug raid, or not killed, he was, he was almost killed uh, during a drug raid, and he was saved because the guy there knew how to use a tourniquet, 
it was a, a, a cop medic, you know, and Phil Bryant went and visited him in the hospital and, and they said, well, he's alive because this guy who was standing next to him knew how to do this. And, and he's like, wow, that's great. And he did a public endorsement. He said he wants every law enforcement officer in the state of Mississippi to have the training and the gear to do that. I know, it's crazy, right? So we're making inroads. People are finally, I'll give you a great example, just an anecdotal example. When I started beating this drum probably six, seven years ago, uh, I offered, excuse me, I'm going through puberty. I offered articles, I have been writing articles for 25 years or so, about traumatic first aid to all these different magazines, outdoor magazines, shooting magazines, police magazines, all of them told me no. No, no, too much liability. Editors in New York, oh, we can't talk about medical training. I said, you just published an article where the guy said to shoot people in the face to make them stop. And you won't let me talk about pressure dressings and tourniquets. You won't let me talk about, you know, a rubber nose hose because there's too much liability. One editor, and I always credit him because this was courageous, a guy named Guy Soggy for Shooting Illustrated Magazine, which is the newsstand publication from the NRA. About seven years ago, I pitched him. And Guy was actually, he was a paramedic. And he said, when I was a paramedic, they told us, oh, no tourniquets, bad juju, you know. So, and I said, look, bro, this is what I'm doing here. Uh, I, at the time, I was like right in the middle of teaching. I was teaching TCCC every other week to young little Navy kids. TCCC is Tactical Combat Casualty Care. And he said, all right, I'll take a chance. Write the article, I'll do it. So I wrote the article, and he called it Range Medicine. And he shared with me all, these, all this hate mail he got from volunteer EMT Bravos. You don't know what you're saying. You can't do that. Oh, when I became an EMT in 1972, they told us blah, 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 blah. Heck, in 1972, they probably had jars of leeches. You know, but you know, that's what we're dealing with. Now, I just recently, the reason I brought that up is I just did an article recently. And normally when I, you know, like every couple of years, I'll do a medical article to kind of refresh people. And we get the, ah, oh, shut up, you can't do that. The volume and the number of, of detractors has decreased. So either those people are like, they're like really old and they're, they don't read the internet anymore or something, but because they're, you know, EMTs in 1972, so they're probably retired. But uh, it's, it's gone down. So we are making progress. But it's kind of like when, when uh, all right, who is older than 40? I'm older than 40. I mean, you kids are stupid. But, uh, when I was, 18, 19, and I like was buying, started buying guns. Concealed carry permits in the United States were unheard of. Or it was like completely unheard of. When I moved, I was living in Florida as a Marine, and Florida passed it, and the, you know, of course the liberals went, ah, we'll be killing each other over parking spaces? You don't know. Wild West, Wild West, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, Texas, and then they, the dominoes started falling, and guess what? <coughs> Here, 30 years later, we went from basically none or just May issue. A lot of states, states had May issue permits, but it was like if you're not the sheriff's cousin, you're not getting a permit, so you just go away. Or, or a really wealthy donor to the sheriff's campaign. Okay, then you can get one. But uh, just regular Joes, forget it. So now we're in a situation where literally within 30 years we went from basically zero to every state has something. Now, you still have California, and you have a lot of your communist states, slave states where it's a May issue. But even the glorious People's Republic of Illinois was forced to come up with a shall issue system. That's big time. So it does take time. It, it's, for those of us that are carrying the boulders, it seems like forever, really it does. But if you, if you look back and pay attention, that's something that we, we rarely do as a society anymore is, is consider what happened more than two days ago. So by the time you are getting ready to have kids, hopefully this will be common. Hopefully this will be as common as CPR or Heimlich. Apparently, Zach was telling me that you're not supposed to say Heimlich anymore because it was offensive to people with the last name Heimlich. 
that they changed their policy. I've heard that. They changed their policy. You're just supposed to call it stomach thrust, upward stomach thrust maneuver or something. Like, I didn't Quick, do the quick, or what was it? Upward stomach thrust maneuver. Quick! <laughs> Someone give him the, the upper stomach thrust maneuver. You mean the Heimlich? Oh, you just offended someone. <laughs> there might be someone in the building named Heimlich and they feel bad. They should feel good. They just saved the guy's life. Well, the guy who invented it named Heimlich? That's what, what I said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I thought the guy who invented it was named Heimlich. That's why they called it the maneuver. Uh, all right, here's what we're going to do. Everybody come on over here and come migrate over. I have the visual aid here. Everyone who came here did a good job because even though you have guns, let's face it, the chances of you using your medical training versus a gun is probably like, what, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 100 to 1? How many people have seen, been in a situation where someone needed medical assistance? You know, and it, like, uh, and heck, we've got, we've got grads of this program who've already been out using the kits and using their skills. <laughs> Freaking, what's his name? Justin Finney? Yeah. Justin Finney uh, is an over-the-road truck driver. He's watching right now. He's like freaking medical man. What's up? Uh -huh. He's like freaking medical man. He took our class, uh, the last, was it the last one? Or second to last? I don't know. Either way. And he's already like had to get out of like two or three separate incidents where he's driving along and there goes a car. <laughs> Bleeding people. So. Oh. Time to get super serious. How many of you remember? Because I know you know the media doesn't want you to remember the uh, the terrorist attack at the mall in Nairobi, Kenya. All right. HBO actually did a really good job. They produced a movie called Terror at the Mall, and they went in and they had film from the security cameras. They pulled security camera footage. They pulled news camera footage. There were people just like in our world today, standing around with cell phones, you know, and, and personal cameras and so forth. They actually had a couple of, of professional photographers that were there with really good equipment, Nikons and what have you, and they pulled that. They went around, they got survivors, they talked to survivors, what did you see, what happened to you, and so forth. I watched this film, and I realized that it was extreme, it was very, very illustrative, because most people did not die. Most of the victims didn't die immediately. Most of them slowly expired. When the terrorists got there, the first thing they did is they heaved grenades. Shock. Get everyone screaming and running. And now that no one is paying attention, they're all going in different directions, they get out and they start shooting people. And most people, everyone's like, oh, if you listen to the intelligentsia in the world, they're like, well, what do you think you're going to do? You don't have any, you're just a guy, you're just a girl. There's no hope for you. These are mean, super mean terrorists with AK-47s. And, but the fact of the matter is, the first, and, and I'm going to show you something right now. Right here, the scene that you're seeing, and it is, it is blurry. Apparently, Zach told me there's a trick called the cloud or the fog. Yeah. You take copywritten video material on the YouTube and you, you insert this fog thing so that this this YouTube Google computers won't kick it. Well, I, I don't know, but uh, a they're like Nazis. A teenager ex explained that to me. <laughs> so, but uh, there's a guy, a guy and his and his young bride were one of the they were the initial victims. They were part of the initial assault. They got injured. They didn't die, but they're bleeding, and so he is laying. They're in a, a burger joint. Make sure we have enough volume for everybody to hear. They're in a burger joint, and he's explaining what's going on, what's happening. Restaurant. It had now been 50 minutes since Neil and his wife had been shot. 50 minutes. They're hiding. Leaks have been pretty badly shredded. Oops, I just did something bad. This is why you don't run technology. <laughs> How do I make that input. not be like that? Input. Input. All right, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, I'll someone come fix me. I'll come fix you. <laughs> All right, everyone, take a take a deep breath. I was I thought I was putting turn the volume. Hey, Zach. Do they have any technology first aid classes? <laughs> hey, Zach.
There we go. <laughs> they all don't touch the TV. Yeah. <laughs> all right, wait. Sure. Did you need the volume up? Yeah. No, it's no, not. What are you doing, crazy? Wait, it's you're doing it on your teeth. Yeah. On, on yours. In the burger restaurant, it had now been 50 minutes Action. since Neil and his wife had been shot. Her legs had been pretty badly shredded. And she was losing quite a lot of blood. My shoulder and arm had been you know, very badly hit. Um, I had you know, holes big enough to put fingers inside. And with the you know, blood I was losing myself, it was harder to stay conscious the whole time. But she was clearly, you know, on the edge and, um, you know, shaking from what must have been blood loss in retrospect. Um, clearly in a lot of pain, clearly very, um, very scared. Um, he tried to move closer to her at that point, uh, took her hand at one point. And, uh, At some point, I'm uh, pretty sure she died. It's obviously hard to tell, but uh, I don't think she was breathing. I knew I couldn't do anything else. I closed her eyes, took her wedding ring so that it wouldn't get lost, and. Um, Just fell back. I think I lay on her with uh, my head on her shoulder for a little while while I tried to get to so I could actually yeah, reach her to be mouth to mouth. But uh, yeah. I don't know, I mean, after that it felt fairly empty. All right, Jared's going to go ahead and cue it up to the next scene, 2130. I right, pause it right there. I will set it up real quick. All right, in situations like school shooting, theater shooting, church shooting, mall shooting, whatever, everybody who's inside caught in the middle of it, they are assuming they're hiding under counters or whatever and the bad guys are moving around, uh, and they're thinking the good guys – the cavalry, the SWAT team, the American heroes, woo, uh, or wherever they happen to be in the world. They're outside, they've got a plan, they're coming. Just hold on, you guys are just hold on, just hold on, you know, just hold on there. The cops are gonna crash in, you know, they're gonna rappel from the roof towers. It's just like every Chuck Norris movie you ever saw, and I just dated myself, because you've never seen a Chuck Norris movie, have you? <laughs> <laughs> yep, see, he's never seen one, he doesn't know what I'm talking about. But, uh, uh, I don't know, Vin Diesel or something, but, uh, my point is this, everybody who's inside assumes that everybody on the outside knows what's going on inside. They've got a plan, they're ready to go, they're hot to come rescue you. Bam, here we go. So the next scene kind of breaks that chi a little bit. Go ahead and play it. You know, how can you shoot somebody one second, and kill the women and children, and then say, oh, now we want to let children go, and then kill some more women and children, and then say, oh, but we're sorry? You know, can you, how can you, can it, just, it just shows how they're just mad. Ninety minutes after the attack had begun, the Kenyan security forces still hadn't gone into the mall. Some civilians have been trying to get help to people injured at the children's cooking competition. So, people, it's all right, everybody get take your seats. People are being shocked, they're bleeding, they're bleeding to death inside of the mall. 90 minutes, the Kenyan security forces show up. And what do they do? Because everyone's like, okay, they, they're on it, right? They're like stacked by the door. They're ready to throw flashbangs in. Boom. No, they're arguing. They're outside arguing about who's going to do what, when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it. 
you and your wife are inside the building, and one of the two or both of you are bleeding to death. And while you're bleeding to death, the experts, the pros, and when I say pros and experts, you're told you shouldn't be doing that. You don't need that. Because why? Don't you think you should just, don't you think you should just leave that to the professionals? I mean, the professionals are outside arguing over who's going to do what. How does that help the lady who's laying in the burger restaurant bleeding to death? Ladies and gentlemen, I know that James Yeager and his school, I know they do a fantastic job driving this point home. Uh, and I'm sure that a lot of other schools do a good job driving it home. But this is the reality of the situation. If you're ever caught in a situation such as movie theater or whatever, it doesn't matter, the only people that are going to have any hope of affecting change are the ones that are there when it goes down. Yes, the police are going to come, the military is going to come, the SWAT, they're all going to show up and they're going to clean up the mess. But that's not going to do any good for the people that are involved in it. If you're right in the middle of it, the only people that are going to have any hope or prayer of doing anything positive and productive are the people there in the building. Everybody wants to tell you, oh, down 911, they're on their way, yada, yada, yada. And they probably are. And they're across the street in the parking lot having an argument. The sheriff, the sheriff's department, and the police are arguing about whose jurisdiction it is and whose team is going to go in. The sheriff's telling him, no, my team is coming. You guys stand down. And he's like, no, I've got guys over here. And he's like, don't enter the building. I'm in charge here. That is the real world that we live in. That is the real world that we live in. Not the, not the happy, fun time, just call 911 and wait and somebody will eventually show up. Why did I spend all this time doing this? Because it doesn't do us any good to go through this entire training course if you don't have a solid mental foundation, if you don't believe that this is why we should do it. It's like going and taking a marksmanship class versus a fighting pistol class. You can go anywhere and get a marksmanship class. I mean, you can go anywhere and they can teach you how to hold a gun, look down the sides, press the trigger, lock it in a, in a Pelican case, put it in your trunk, and then take it home. That's not fighting pistol. And anybody can teach you how to put a Band-Aid on. But the trick is, eventually, you're gonna leave here, and if you have a kit like this, or you have a, a, any other kind of kit, at some point in time, you won't have used it. And you're like, man, I bet, and, and the devil's gonna crawl up on your shoulder, and the devil's gonna say, you've been carrying that crap around for months never needed it. It's not going to kill you to just leave it home today. It's not going to kill you to just leave it on the dresser. You're just going to the store. You're just going to the store again, coming back. What could happen? Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly when you're going to need it. The moment you think, I'm just going to run to the store real quick and get back, I'll just leave it on, leave it on the dresser. I've been toting this crap around for That's why we reinforce it with stuff like this. Those people weren't going to a slaughter. There was a, did, did you guys watch it? Did anybody watch that? That was, all right, on that was a beautiful sunny day. They had a, a parking garage and on the, the upper level of the parking garage they were having a children's cooking competition. Uh, people were shopping, you know, there's a grocery store inside the mall. There's, they weren't going to a slaughter, they weren't going to a fight. It, but it, there it is, bam. Uh, so what do you do? And the reason that, you know, that guy, the first guy we watched, he didn't have the this, this skill, the tools, and the mental drive to do something. He didn't have it. So his options were to hold his wife's hand and watch her bleed to death. That was, him. that was the only thing in his toolbox, is I'm a victim, someone needs to come in here and rescue us. Where are they? Why aren't they rescuing? All right, take a break. Everybody get up. Um, urine out, caffeine in, as the Colonel Grossman is apt to say. And uh, stretch them out because I know it's morning time.
you want to tell Zach what a good job he's doing, you can, you can always give him moral encouragement uh, as we go by. And if you've ever ordered anything from us and it arrived promptly, thanks Zach. And if it didn't,